It's now time for the latest installment of This Week in History. I'm not going to lie, this is the one I've been most excited about, I guess, thus far through all the times of doing This Week in History. I always try to make it interesting thinking of those that don't like history. That's kind of what I look at. Like I'm trying to make it so that even those that don't like history will be interested in this segment. This one's a really good segment. So let's just jump right into it. This week in history, 87 years ago, April 12th, 1934, the fastest wind gust ever recorded at the time was recorded on Mount Washington in New Hampshire. The record gust was 231 miles an hour. Just imagine that. For those that may not have ever been to Mount Washington, it's 6,288 feet above sea level and is the tallest mountain east of the Mississippi River, so it's only natural that the wind gusts up there will be crazy. 231 miles an hour is a bit excessive, but how's this for some facts about Mount Washington? The calmest month of the year weather-wise is August, and even then the winds average 24 miles an hour daily. Just imagine, you know, 25 mile an hour wind gusts outside. That's pretty stiff. And that's the calmest it gets ever there. In the winter, hurricane force winds are felt basically once every three days. And hurricane force are 74 miles an hour or above. And the peak gets 100 plus mile an hour winds about once a week. So the 231 mile an hour wind gust was April 12th, 1934. That record stood for nearly 62 years. It was topped at Barrow Island, Australia during Typhoon Olivia in 1996. That record was 253 miles an hour. And for any weather buffs out there, the strongest hurricane wind gusts ever upon landing were Hurricane Camille in 1969 that were 190 miles an hour. So think about that. Mount Washington, I don't know what the weather was like that day, but 231 miles an hour made it 40 miles an hour stronger than the strongest hurricane ever in this country. And that was 87 years ago, this week in history. This week in history, 156 years ago, April 15th, 1865, President Abraham Lincoln dies from his gunshot wound suffered the night before at Ford's Theater. The attack was from John Wilkes Booth, who was a famous actor and Confederate sympathizer, who was not happy about the fact that only five days earlier, Confederate General Robert E. Lee had surrendered his army at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, which for all intents and purposes ended the Civil War. Lincoln was at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. on April 14th to see Laura Keene's acclaimed performance of Our American Cousin. Booth had an idea not only to kill Lincoln, but to also assassinate Vice President Andrew Johnson and Secretary of State William Seward, figuring that this mass of assassinations at the top of the government would throw the Union into disarray and give the Confederates perhaps one last gasp. Unfortunately for them, Andrew Johnson and William Seward both were left, well, Seward got attacked in his bed, and he was saved by a metal splint around his neck to protect his jaw. So when the guy that went in there tried to stab him, he basically, he did stab him a few times, but he got mostly the metal splint. John Wilkes Booth slipped into the president's box and fired his 44 caliber single-shot Derringer pistol into the back of Lincoln's head. It took Lincoln all night as he clung to life, but he passed away at 7.22 a.m. on April 15, 1865. Booth fled, and there was the largest manhunt in history. On April 26, the Union troops caught up with him inside a Virginia barn and set fire to it. Booth was shot in the neck by Boston Corbett. He thought that Booth was raising his gun as if he was going to shoot at the troops outside. So Booth died, his co-conspirators were all found guilty, and all sentenced to death by hanging. That's a very abbreviated version of this whole series of events. But this week in history, 156 years ago, President Abraham Lincoln was the first president ever to be assassinated. This week in history, 109 years ago, April 15th, 1912, the RMS Titanic, the unsinkable ship, slips below the waves in the North Atlantic. The Titanic sank during its maiden voyage from Southampton, England, en route to New York City. And obviously, it's one of the most famous shipwrecks in the history of the world. Everyone knows about it. It struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic. 
They made the movie about it. It was run by the White Star Line and was 883 feet in length. Less than two weeks before the ship set sail on its maiden voyage, it underwent its sea trials, after which the Titanic was declared seaworthy and declared unsinkable. The ship left Southampton, England on April 10th, 1912, captained by Edward J. Smith, who was known as the Millionaire's Captain because of his popularity with wealthy passengers. And there were, there were a lot of prominent rich people aboard the Titanic's maiden voyage. It was like a status symbol to say that you were aboard the maiden voyage. But you became famous for being on it for a different reason, unfortunately. The maiden voyage had 2,200 people aboard, approximately 1,300 of whom were passengers. And the ship had been receiving iceberg warnings in the hours leading up to when they struck one. And there were warnings, so Captain Smith slightly altered the ship's course to head farther south, but he maintained the ship's speed of 22 knots. At approximately 9.40 p.m. on April 14th, a ship called the Misaba sent a warning of an ice field, but that was never relayed to the bridge of the Titanic. At approximately 11.40 p.m., about 400 nautical miles south of Newfoundland, Canada, an iceberg was sighted and the bridge was notified, but by this point it was too late. And even though the ship began to turn, it struck the iceberg and it struck it in such a way that the ship kept going. It was like the you didn't feel it because the ship was so big, but it was trouble and there was no fixing the hole that was punched into the Titanic. The distress signal sent out, the closest one reached a ship called the Carpathia at 1220 a.m., but that ship was 58 nautical miles away, which would mean three hours it would need to reach the Titanic. And unfortunately, there weren't enough lifeboats for everyone. It had 20 lifeboats, which would carry almost 1,200 people. But that meant that there were almost 1,000 that were kind of out of luck. And anyone who's seen the movie, you know, they launched some of the boats that were way below capacity. So even the 1,200 that could have been saved were not. In the end, only 705 people would be rescued by lifeboat. In total, it took 2 hours and 40 minutes for the Titanic to sink. And in the end, more than 1,500 people died on the unsinkable ship 109 years ago this week. On a lighter note, this week in history, 88 years ago, April 14th, 1933, the first modern sighting of the Loch Ness Monster is recorded. The sighting wouldn't be reported to local news until May 2nd, 1933. It was a local couple in Scotland that said they had seen an enormous animal rolling and plunging on the surface of Loch Ness. And it immediately became a phenomenon in London. Newspapers sent correspondence to Scotland, and there was a circus that offered a £20,000 reward for the capture of the Loch Ness Monster. After the report went public on May 2nd, another couple claimed to have seen the animal on land. But unfortunately, there have been no substantiated images or proof of the Loch Ness Monster. There was a famous photo in 1934, but that has been revealed to be a hoax. They've done sonar expeditions in the 80s and 90s with inconclusive readings. The Loch Ness Monster itself, in lore, is supposed to be like a plesiosaur, like a water dinosaur with a big long neck, a long tail, and flippers. So for almost a century, the Loch Ness Monster has been right up there with Bigfoot and the Yeti as the most famous mythical animals in the world. But this week in history, 88 years ago, the first modern sighting of the Loch Ness Monster occurred in Scotland. And now it's time for another time capsule. I chose April 15th, 1955, because that was the first year that the tax day was April 15th. So I figured why not bring some light to a situation that's never fun, paying taxes. The number one song in America was The Ballad of Davy Crockett by Bill Hayes. It was number one for five weeks and part of this Davy Crockett craze of 1955. In fact, at one point, there were three versions of the same song on the charts. The craze is even mentioned in Back to the Future, which took place in 1955. The number one movie was A Man Called Peter, starring Richard Todd, and was a film based on the life of preacher Peter Marshall, who served as chaplain of the United States Senate and pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. It grossed $4.5 million on a budget of one75 and has an 85% positive rating on Rotten Tomatoes, so I guess you should go see it. The number one TV show was the game show The $64,000 Question, which narrowly beat out I Love Lucy. 
It was hosted by Hal March and was on from 1955 to 58 and is one of the shows that is embroiled in that famous 1950s quiz show scandal where some contestants said they got answers ahead of time and such. That's a whole other can of worms to open up for this week in history. And if you were looking to eat in 1955, the first McDonald's opened by Ray Kroc opened up in Des Plaines, Illinois. This McDonald's had 15-cent hamburgers, 19-cent cheeseburgers, and 10-cent fries and sodas. On the first day of opening, Ray Kroc's McDonald's made $366.12, which is just under $3,600 in today's money. So there's the foray into fast food with McDonald's. That'll put a bow on This Week in History with another time capsule. Tune in for the next episode of This Week in History where we'll find another interesting set of stories, even for those of you that don't like history. I hope you found this one interesting. (laughs) 